things here. That down here. All right. Go ahead and take your Bible and turn to the book of John. Book of John. We're going to be in chapter 16 this morning. Charlie, do you need to come up here next to the stand or you can get there if you want, it's fine. John chapter 16. Had your donuts this morning. You guys are set, ready to go. Got a long day today. Looking forward to it. Take these teenagers down to Miami with us this afternoon, and it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day. I've been looking forward to today since last year when I was here and did this, did the gauntlet, right? Oh, this, is, this is just an awesome day, and uh, I'm excited about it. Um, hey, just a couple of questions here to get started this morning. Uh, Mr. Hershey Kiss is here. Of course, you've already had a donut, so you don't really need more sugar, but you can, you can handle more sugar, right? Um, I preached two messages yesterday, two messages. Right? I just want you to tell me anything that I preached yesterday. All right? Start with Shamir. You have to be doers, hearers, and doers of the word. All right. Hearers and doers of the word. Okay? Very good. Anybody else? Anything? No? Not Shamir? All right? Our righteousness is like uh, both your acts to Jesus. Very good. All right? Anybody else? I'd like to just go down the line. What's 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 one thing? Yes, sir. Over here on the sin. Anybody who's not doer of the word is like a man. All right, yeah, uh, we read that, all right. Anybody else? All right, so the first first message, we talked about what it meant to be a wise or a foolish man, right? Somebody that hasn't answered a question yet. What do you have to do to be a wise man? There's two things. Uh, in order to be a wise man, you have to do, you have to read the Word and do the Word. Read it and do it. Very good, all right, very good. Now... I hope that you listen to his answer. What do you have to do to be a blessed man? Go ahead. It's the same answer. Obey. <laughs> obey. Read the word and obey it. Very good. All right. What do you have to do to not be deceived? To obey. To obey. Read the word and obey. You're right. You're good. All right. Very good. All right. Fantastic. Now, we talked about uh, yesterday, we talked about how our good works, right, we had a bad smell, right, and that they were uh, as filthy rags, okay? What are filthy rags? Somebody that hasn't answered a question yet. Grave clothes. Grave clothes. All right, great. He wanted to hurt his kids. See that on his face. He's excited, okay? All right. Um, so, will grave clothes get you into heaven? No. No, you can't have that. No, right? All right, very good. All right, now, we talked at the very end. We said, you know what, if we were standing before the gates of heaven, and uh, we wanted to give the Lord something that smelled good, right? We wanted to say, this is what I'm trusting in. What would you have to show them what smelled good to the Lord? Yeah. Baptism. No. No, that's a word. That smells bad, right? That's a filthy rat. As far as oh. uh, trusting in that to get us to heaven, right? Yeah. To believe and trust in Jesus. To believe and trust in Jesus. All right, you get the whole bag. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good. You guys are paying attention. That's fantastic. Praise the Lord for that. All right, are you in John chapter 16? Yes. All right, John chapter 16. All right, we want to pick it up there in verse number 7. Okay? Verse number 7. The Bible says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. All right, everybody stop. Look up here. All right? Now, what color <coughs> letters are you reading about in your Bible? Right, right. They're red. All right, so what does that mean? Hey, Josiah, what does that mean? Jesus. They're, that's right. They're Jesus. This is Jesus speaking here, okay? Um, did Jesus ever tell a lie? No. Did Jesus ne ever say anything that wasn't true? No. No, because he was the Son of God, right? <laughs> so why would Jesus have to say, uh, nevertheless, I tell you the truth? You know, you, that's, a, that's an interesting thing for the Son of God to say, right? You know what I think here? I think that, um, and it's true for me too, listen, if I was to ever start a conversation by saying, listen, I've got to tell you the truth, all right? I would say that to preface because what I'm about to say would be pretty hard to understand. Mm -hmm. And what I'm about to say probably is not going to make sense to you, so I would preface that by saying, whatever I'm about to say is going to be true. Okay? Now we know the whole Word of God is true. But here Jesus is <clears throat> prefacing what He's going to say by, look, no matter what comes out of my mouth next, I just want you to know it's truth. It's not going to sound like truth, 
but it's truth. Okay? So we look at it again, there in John chapter 16, verse number 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Now he's talking here to the disciples, all right? And he says, it is expedient for you. All right, look back up here. Let's talk about this word expedient for a minute, okay? Expedient means better than. It means that it's an advantage to you, okay? So he says, look, what I'm about to say is not going to make sense, but it's true, okay? And what I'm about to say is not going to sound like it's good to you, but it's better for you, okay, than anything that you've ever experienced before in your life, okay? So he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, and it is expedient for you. Now, we understand this word expedient. We, we know what it means for something to be good for us. Um, do you guys realize that you probably shouldn't eat donuts all day, every day, right? It, would, it wouldn't be good for you, would it, right? On occasion, you need to probably have some vegetables, right? And things that, you know, we, we might be able to go without those things, you know, we would think. But really, it's kind of helpful to have some vegetables every now and then. My wife went out of town for about uh, a week. And I, I don't remember exactly where she went. But uh, she, she left me for a week, right? She, just, she was gone. I think she went to visit her family. And uh, so I was at home, and I decided, you know what? Man, I am going to have hamburgers, hot dogs, potato chips, and Coca-Cola every day this week. Right, and I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to do a lot of cooking, so I did all the cooking the first day she left. Right, and I just had stacks of hamburgers and rows of hot dogs sitting in the refrigerator. Right, breakfast, lunch, dinner, you know, hamburgers, hot dogs. Right, I mean, it was just, it was just going to be fantastic. When she got back, I was so sick. I mean, I was just, I was just, I was about to die. And I said something to her when she came back in that I've never said. I don't think I've ever said since, right? I got, I was, I said, Emily, will you please fix me a vegetable, right? I didn't, I don't really want vegetables, but you know what? I learned that week that vegetables were expedient for me. They're good for you, right? And here, this is what this word means. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you, okay? And Jesus here is talking, and he's talking to his disciples, right? And he says, it is good for you, it is expedient for you that I go where? Away. Away? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Here's what I, I used to think. I used to be jealous of the disciples. Yeah. Okay? Because the disciples got to be with Jesus when Jesus was here on this earth. Right? And uh, they got to walk with Jesus. They got to see Jesus do the miracles. Okay? And, uh, I mean, it would have been, would have been neat to just have a conversation with Jesus. You sit and just talk and just, just ask him about some things. I mean, man, that would have been fantastic, right? So these men had that, okay? And he says to them, he says, look, I'm about to tell you the truth. It is good for you that I go away. Now, I don't think that would have made any sense. I, if I was one of the disciples, I'd have been like, what? You know, that doesn't make any sense. I don't want you to go anywhere, you know, I want you to set up your kingdom here and, and all these things, you know, I have all these expectations and, no, oh, man, this is just going to be great, this doesn't need to end, and, and why would it be good for us if, if you went away? And to make it even worse, let's look back in the beginning of chapter 16 at what Jesus had just told them, okay? Jesus says there, right before he says this in verse number 7, he says, these things have I spoken unto you, I'm reading in verse 1, these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended, they shall put you out of the synagogues. That's where the Jewish people met to worship. Okay? Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Well, I'm telling you, this is just great news, isn't it? It's just wonderful. He tells them, look, people aren't going to want you to be around. They're going to kick you out of the worship places. And uh, they're going to kill you. And you know what? When they kill you, they're going to think that they're doing God's service. Right? And then he says, but don't worry. I'm leaving, but that's a good thing for you. <laughs> it, just, it, just, it's like, it's just, it's just, it just doesn't make any sense at all. It just doesn't make any sense. But he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. Now let's finish reading in the verse and figure out why it's good for us that he went away. He says, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. Now the Comforter is the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about him in just a minute. But the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will not come unto you. But if I depart, if I leave, then I will send him unto you. Okay? Now, God is uh, referred to as a trinity. It's a triune God. It is 
three persons but one God. Okay, now don't ask me to be able to explain this to you. I don't understand it. Okay, maybe you can ask Pastor Price, but you know what? He probably doesn't understand it totally either. But I'm okay that I don't understand everything completely about God. Because if I understood everything completely about God, He wouldn't be God anymore. Right? I'm okay that there are some things about God that I can't fully understand or explain. But listen, God is one God, but it's God the Father, it's God the Son, and it's God the Holy Spirit. Okay? And He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay? So at this point in time, Jesus was always referring to His Father, which was in heaven. He would pray to His Father, which was in heaven. So you had God the Father, who was in heaven. Then you had Jesus the Son, who was here in human flesh, walking among humans' kind. Okay? And then... Jesus says to here, look, if it's good for you that I go away because when I go away, I'm going to send you something even better. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. Okay? And this is just fascinating. Okay? The Bible teaches us, you don't have to turn there, but I just want to read this verse. The Bible teaches us in the book of Ephesians that when we trust Jesus to be our Savior, this only is for somebody who's trusted Jesus to be their Savior. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13, it says, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. All right? After you've heard the gospel, after you've believed the gospel, after you've been forgiven of your sins, you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. The Bible says, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. I want to teach you just an amazing truth. Okay? The Bible says, when you trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior, God, the Holy Spirit, moves in and he lives inside of you. That is pretty neat. Did you know that? God moves in and he takes up residence in your body. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, um, I forget the chapter right off the top of my head, it may be 2 Corinthians, but he says that your body is the temple, is the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty neat. Okay? So this is what I'm saying. Pastor Price trusted Jesus Christ to be his Savior. Living inside of Pastor Price is God the Holy Spirit. Charlie has trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Living inside of Charlie, right, is God the Holy Spirit. Mr. Andrew has trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Living inside of Andrew is God the Holy Spirit. That's pretty neat, right? Now, let's think about this. Why would that be better than having Jesus here? Okay? Now, let's suppose, let's just make believe for a minute that Jesus is sitting right here on, on the front quarter in the seat, right? He's, he's here with us today, okay? Now, when we leave tonight, right? After, maybe he goes with us. He does the gauntlet with us all day today, okay? And so we, we get to be with Jesus all day. When we leave and go home tonight, who's he going to go with? One of us. He could only go with one of us, couldn't he? So if he went with Jose... Uh, that means he's not with Anthony. If he went with Anthony, well, that means he's not with Jose. Right? I mean, that, that would kind of be a bummer in that sense. Okay? You know, if Jesus was here with us today to run the gauntlet, then in my church in South Carolina, uh, Jesus wouldn't be there today because he'd be here. Okay? The Bible teaches when, when God became man and took upon himself flesh, he, 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 he placed limitations upon himself. He humbled himself and became a man and being found in the form of a servant, he became obedient even unto death. Okay? So, Jesus when he was here he, he had to come because he had to pay the sacrifice for our sins, but in a sense, Jesus could only be in one place at one time when he was in his body. So he's given unto us his Holy Spirit, and so now you know what, we may all be together today, but then when we go home tonight, Pastor Price is going to take God with him. Charlie's going to take God with him. Andrew's going to take God with him. I'm going to take God with me. If you're saved, you take God with you. Back in South Carolina, in my church, they're having Sunday school right now. Everybody who's saved, they have God with them. I mean, that's really amazing. Yes. This is expedient for you. It is good for you that Jesus is not here in physical presence, but that he has given to you the Holy Spirit so that you have God living inside of you. I mean, that's amazing. That's amazing. Now I want us to consider just a little bit this passage here that we're about to read. We've looked at verse 7, kind of giving us this introduction here to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to read verses 8, 9, and 10. Okay, 
Verses 8, 9, and 10 talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to a person who hasn't trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior yet. All right? Um, we're going to look at that. Look at verse 8. It says, And when He has come, He, the Holy Spirit, when He has come, He will reprove the world. Okay? The world is all people who have never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. We see that same word in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Okay? So, verses 8, 9, and 10, that's talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to someone who has not yet trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And, well, actually, verse 11 also. Then look down at verse number 12, right? The wording changes a little bit. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you. So now he's talking to his disciples again, people who believe in him. He says, but you cannot bear them now. All right, so here he begins to transition. He says, okay, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to someone who hasn't trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then in verse 12, he says, okay, now I'm going to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to someone who has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. So I just want us to take the next few minutes this morning, and I want us to consider the ministry of the Holy Spirit, because it is expedient for us that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and that we have the Holy Spirit working on us, okay? So let's just talk about this for a few minutes, all right? Let's read verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. So here we want to consider the Holy Spirit's ministry to someone who is not yet saved, all right? So the Bible says in verse 8, and when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he, the Holy Spirit, will reprove. Now that word reprove means to convict or to convince, okay? He will reprove the world of three things, sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Okay? So if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, um, this is what the Holy Spirit is trying to work on you about. Okay? Um, for anybody in this room who has trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have experienced everything I'm about to say. You know exactly what this is because you experienced it whenever you were getting saved. Okay? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. All right? So in other words, the Bible says we're all sinners, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and when you hear those truths and you hear the teaching and preaching from the Word of God, you realize, as we talked about the first night we met together, the purpose of the law is to show us that we're what? Sinners. Sinners and that we're guilty before God. Okay? So we hear the preaching of the Word, and then we begin, hey, Josh, how are you doing? It's good to see you. And so we, we hear the preaching of the Word, right? And then we, we just sense this conviction in our hearts and in our souls that what we're hearing is true and that, yes, you know what? Uh, I am a sinner. I have done wrong things. I am not at peace with God. Okay? And we hear those things and the Holy Spirit's job is to convince us that we are sinners. Okay? Then the Holy Spirit convinces us about righteousness. Okay? He convinces us really about two things of righteousness. The first one's really tight, closely tied to the fact of sin. And that's we're not righteous. And what we were talking about last night, the best that we can give, all of our righteousnesses, if we're counting on those to get us to heaven, are only worth grave clothes, right? So he convinces us of those things. He, he says, you know what, that is true. And there's this voice that says, yes, that's true, that's true, this is true, this is true. And he's working and he's convincing you that what the Bible says is true, that you're a sinner and that your righteousnesses will not get you to heaven. But also that Jesus Christ was righteous. Okay? It says there in that verse, verse number 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. You know, when Jesus was here, uh, there was a walking example of perfect righteousness. But we don't have Jesus here with us today to see. So today we have the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to convince us that what the Bible says is true about Jesus and that Jesus was without sin and that He was perfectly righteous. He was the real Son of God. So the Holy Spirit convinces us about sin, and the Holy Spirit convinces us about righteousness, and then in verse 11, the Holy Spirit convinces us about judgment. Okay? And uh, you can hold your Bibles there, but in Hebrews chapter 9, in verse number 27, the Bible says this, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So what's going to happen to you in your life according to this verse? Two things. What's going to happen? Yes? You're going to die, and then after you die, what's going to happen? You're going to be judged. You're going to be judged by who? 
You're going to be judged by God. You're going to stand before God, and you're going to give an account of your life. Okay? And the Holy Spirit bears that home to you and says, you know what, that's true. This is going to happen. You're going to die, and you're going to stand before God one day. Okay? And you're going to be judged. Okay? And the Bible tells us that uh, um, when we stand before the Lord, the Bible says if you stand before the Lord and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says at the end of that judgment you'll be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. And that's Revelation chapter number 20. Okay? So the Holy Spirit convinces us that these things are true. Can I tell you when the Holy Spirit convinced me of these things? I was five years old. I'm 38 now, so it was 33 years ago. It's 33 years ago. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, just a little bit south there. I'm a Braves fan, so don't hold it against Amen. me. Okay? Oh, no. All right? And, uh, you know, I, I moved down here to Florida and lived for a little while, right? When I moved here, I became a, you know, a Marlins fan just because I had been out of touch with the Braves, you know, when I went to school and all these different things and didn't have time for any of that stuff. Like that. Then I moved away, and I'm telling you, just everything is right again. Back with the tomahawk chop, right? And the Braves fan is great. So anyway, but anyway, that's where I grew up, right? But I was five years old, and I don't know if I had heard uh, some preaching on the subject of hell or, or, or what it was, but you know what? I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I was a sinner, and I knew that, that I deserved to go to hell. And so I was trying to go to sleep one night, five years old, trying to go to sleep, laying there in my bed, and I knew that if I went to sleep and something happened that night, and I died, that I would wake up in hell. Because I never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And God was working on me. I mean, it was like God was talking to me. Listen, you deserve to go to hell. You're a sinner. Your righteousness, your good things won't get you to heaven. You need to trust in Jesus Christ to be your Savior. So what does every five-year-old boy who can't sleep and is scared to death at night do? He calls for his mother, right? Yeah. I screamed, Mom! You know? And so she comes in, didn't know what was going on, and I told her what was happening. And you know what she did? She got the Bible. And she showed me, says, you know what? This is right. You, you are a sinner. Your righteousness won't get you to heaven. Jesus Christ loves you and He died for you. He took the payment for your sin. And now all you have to do is call upon Him. Call upon Him to save you and you'll be saved. You know, so as a five-year-old boy, I didn't understand the whole Bible. I understood very little of the Bible, but I understood one thing. I was a sinner. I deserved to go to hell. And I knew Jesus saved me. And I wanted to go to heaven and be with Him. And so I asked Him to forgive me of my sins and He did. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> All you have to do to be forgiven of your sins is trust in Jesus that He, that he died on the cross for you and just, just ask Him. I mean, it's just, just that simple, right? Just believe, right? And so right then and there, I experienced the ministry of the Holy Spirit right here as it's talking about where He was convincing me of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And then the natural response to that is to cry out to God for salvation. You know, If you've never done that, you can do that today. Okay? You can do that today. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? And uh, if, you're, if you're saved already and you've been forgiven of your sins, aren't you glad for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you before you were saved? Nobody can get saved without the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit about sin and about righteousness and about judgment. Right? Now, um, on this subject of judgment, I've got, I've got enough time. Let's, let's talk about this. The Bible talks about the lake of fire. Okay? And I just want to mention this because there is so much confusion today about what the lake of fire is, what hell is, okay, and what it looks like and what takes place there, and so on and so forth. Okay? Um, you've probably all seen a cartoon comic or something on TV that shows the devil in a what color suit? Red. Red, right? With a does he have a tail? Yeah. With a triangle on the end of the tail? Right? And then what's he holding? A pitchfork. Okay? All right? Listen. <laughs> Do you think that description of the devil came from here? It didn't. That's not what the devil looks like. Okay? That's uh, a cartoon depiction, and it's really stupid. Okay? Um, a demon. Okay? Demons are real. Okay? They are fallen angels. Okay? According to the Bible. Okay? Okay? Um, well, in, in, in movies that you've seen, okay, that depict something about the underworld, uh, are, is anybody at home in hell and comfortable there? No. Who? The devil. It's like his home, right? I mean, he, that's where he lives. 
He lives in hell. And he's, he's like happy in hell. It, you know, the, the way that he's depicted in our culture. The demons are happy in hell. Okay? And what do they do in hell? Party. They party. They have a good time. And then the people that are in hell, they like punish the people. You, you, you've seen this, right? That's, that's most of the time. Like if, you're, if you learn about hell from somewhere other than the Bible, you would think that hell is the home of Satan and the home of the demons, and it's where bad people go, and then they're tormented by the demons and Satan for the, all, of, all, of, all of eternity, right? That is so stupid. Okay? That's, that's, that's not the picture of the Bible. That's right. That's not what the book says. Okay? Satan and the demons are not in hell today. Do you know where Satan is today? Huh? On earth. He's walking about, the Bible says in the book of 1 Peter, he's walking about as a lion seeking whom he may devour and destroy. You know where the demons are today? They're here. They're not in hell. Do you know why hell was created? Matthew chapter 25, verse number 41, I think it is. The Bible says hell was created not for mankind, but for the devil and his demons. When the, when the devil is cast into hell in Revelation chapter 20, right before the great white throne judgment, okay, and the demons are cast into hell, they're cast into hell there forever to be tormented. The flames of hell are there and they were designed to contain the devil and the fallen angels that have fallen him who are referred to as demons. Okay? Hell is not their home. Hell is their eternal resting place of damnation. It is where they will be judged for all of eternity, where they will be separated from God. Okay? This is not a pleasant place. There's no partying in hell. There's no booze in hell. There's no anything that provides pleasure in hell. There's no love in hell. It's just torment in hell. Okay? And the Bible says it was designed for the devil and for his angels. Now the Bible says because we're sinners and we've separated ourselves from God, that if we die without being forgiven, then we will also spend an eternity in hell. But the demons won't be tormenting us there. The fires of hell will be tormenting us in hell, and it will be according to God's judgment upon your life for the things that you've done in your life. That's what the Bible teaches about hell. So there's so much confusion, right? You know, the Bible says that, that Satan uh, transforms himself into an angel of light. He doesn't walk around in a red suit with a pitchfork advertising who he is. He works in very deceptive manners to confuse people. And it almost comes across as something that will be good for you. Okay? So let's let the Bible define to us what hell is. Let's, 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 have, let's take that proper understanding uh, with us whenever we leave here. Okay? Now, just a moment to say this before we move on to the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the Christian. Okay? Um, As a saved person, having understood the ministry of the Holy Spirit to lost people in our lives, okay, when we're trying to lead somebody to Christ, it's not our job to produce conviction in that person's life. So we shouldn't be trying to. We need to partner with the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit do His job. Okay? So, uh, let's say that uh, Todd doesn't know Jesus Christ as a Savior. And uh, you know what? I'm burdened about Todd. And so I want to help Todd, you know, understand the Scriptures so that he can trust Christ, be forgiven of his sins, and have a home in heaven, right? So I go and I talk to Todd, and my job is not to convince or to convict him that he's a sinner. My job is not to convince or to convict him that he's not righteous. My job is not to convince or convict him about hell or judgment or any of those things. Whose job is that? It's the Holy Spirit's job. Okay. So what's my job then? As a Christian, my job is to present the truth. That's it. I don't have to produce the conviction. I don't have to work the conviction. I just present the Word of God. The Bible refers to the Word of God as the sword of who? Of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. So when I use the Word of God, and I present the truth of the Word of God, this is what I do when I'm preaching, right? I'm partnering with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to, say, to convict you that what I'm saying is true. And it's the same way when we talk to somebody about the Lord, and we try to lead somebody to the Lord. We are looking for 
partnership with the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. All right? So as Christians, let's understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit to lost people. And when we are witnessing and leading people to the Lord, let's be faithful to present the Word and then let God do what only God can do. Okay? And let's only do what we can do. All right? And let's not try to produce that conviction in them. Okay? All right, now, let's consider the Holy Spirit's ministry to those people who are saved. All right? So if a person has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, they've been forgiven of their sins, the Holy Spirit has moved in and now resides within, and your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit doing to help you in your life? Okay? That's a good question. I'm really glad that you asked. Yeah, that was good. All right, so let's look at verse number 12. Where would you look at it? It says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot hear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, okay, is come, he will, what's the next word? What's the next word? Guide. Guide. He will guide you into all truth. You know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit leads and guides and teaches us. And that is a wonderful thing to have as a Christian. When we read the Bible, if we're understanding what we're reading, it's because the Holy Spirit is helping us to understand what we're reading. You know, you know I talked to you guys the other day about having a time where you read the Bible every day, right? Do you remember that? Because the Bereans were more noble, okay? Before you read the Bible, you know what you should do? You should ask God to help you understand it. Ask Him to guide you into all truth. Okay? The Bible says in John 17, 17, Thy word is truth, and here He's saying that this, His job is to lead and guide you into all truth. Okay? So that's what we want to do. We want to be depending on the ministry of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the truths of the Scriptures. His name, back in verse number 7, it says, If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. If you're saved, have you ever experienced the comforting ministry of the Holy Spirit? Oh, yes, we have, right? Yeah, you lose a loved one or someone that's close in your family, and I'm telling you, just, just God just overwhelms you with His love through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing thing. What we have is so special in the ministry of of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So He's a comforter. He leads and He guides and He teaches us. I want to go to a couple of different passages in Scripture. Uh, if you're able to follow, please do so. We'll go to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5. And I don't have time to fully expound on all of this, but I do just want to touch on these areas and maybe give you um, a thirst to do some of your own, some, some more personal study uh, in these areas. But the Bible gives us several commands concerning the Holy Spirit uh, that we all need to be understanding and applying to our lives. The Bible says, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. There is a battle going on in your life if you're a Christian. There's the desires of your flesh, the sinful desires of your flesh, and then there's the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, and those two are not on the same page. There's a battle that's always taking place. And the Bible says, if you will learn to walk in the Spirit, which is to depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can overcome the sinful temptations of your flesh. Okay. Now, I find it fascinating in verse number 16, and I'll just mention this in passing. The Bible says, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Bible does not say that you will not experience the lust of the flesh. The Bible says you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. So walking in the Spirit is the key to living a Christian victorious life over sin into walking and living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. Okay, um, So, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We need to know what it means to walk in the Holy Spirit. All right? Look in uh, Ephesians chapter 5. This is just one book to your right. So just turn a few pages to your right. You'll turn to Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 18. Okay, The Bible says, 
something there as well that kind of dovetails and fits in with walking in the Spirit. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, verse 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be, what? Filled with the Spirit. But be filled with the Spirit. Now what does that mean? I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> All right? Um, the, the term here, filled, is a, is a nautical term. So back in this day, uh, they would get on these boats and they had the huge sails. I mean, the most thing thing that we can relate to today would be like an old-timey pir pirate ship, right? So the big ship with all the sails, right? They'd get on these things and they'd sail around uh, in those things. And uh, the wind, in order to move that boat, would have to come and fill the sails of the boat. And when the wind would fill the sails of the boat, the wind would apply pressure to the boat to get it to move in a certain direction. Does that make sense to everybody? You see that? Okay. Now, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Okay. It basically means that the Holy Spirit applies pressure to move you in a certain direction. Have you ever experienced that before, Christian? Have you ever been somewhere and you're minding your own business and then the Lord like speaks to you and applies pressure to to go talk to somebody about Him? Have you ever experienced that before? You have, haven't you? I have. It says, go over there and give that person a tract. Go over there and witness to that person. Be a witness for me. You know what that is? That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, you can exercise your choice then. You can drop the cells and you cannot be filled with the Spirit. Or you can keep those cells up and you can obey the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's what being filled with the Spirit is. Being filled with the Spirit is always saying yes to the applied pressure. Okay? You know, I, I used to think that walking in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit was just like a, the automatic fix for the Christian life. Okay? So I was looking for a lightning bolt to come down and hit me from heaven, Jose. Right? I was looking for something to come down and hit me from in heaven and then just fix me for that whole day. But you know what? That never happens. Never happens. Okay? So it is constantly depending upon the Lord, looking to the Lord for His leading, guiding, directing in your life. And then when He does that, just being obedient. Just saying, okay, Lord, I'll do whatever it is that you ask me to do. Okay? Now, while I'm talking about this, let me say one thing. The Holy Spirit will never, ever tell you to do anything that is contrary to His Word. That's one of the reasons it's so important that we understand the Bible. And we read the Bible. And they were constantly sitting under the teaching and preaching of the Bible. Okay? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And this is the Word of truth. And they go together. So if you ever think that the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something, but it's obviously not what this Bible would say, then you are wrong. And that's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So there's some discernment that goes along with this as well. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us as we conclude here, that we can quench the Spirit, that's 1 Thessalonians 5.19, and we can grieve the Spirit, that's Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30. All right, so what do those things mean? Well, very simply, uh, quenching the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's applying pressure, trying to get you to do something, and you say, no. Has the Holy Spirit ever asked you to do something and you said no? I have. I I'm ashamed to admit, but I have. All right? That is the definition of what it means to quench the Spirit. Quench has the idea of there's a fire and you throw water on it. You put it out. You quench it. You get rid of it. Right? We're not to quench uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We're to embrace the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life. And then grieving the Holy Spirit of God, I think, is a slightly different nuance than, than to quench. But to grieve the Holy Spirit of God would be to be involved with things that you shouldn't be involved with. The Holy Spirit is convicting you about sin, something in your life that you need to give up, and you won't give it up and you are just grieving. You're grieving God, and you're not doing the things that He wants you to do. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know, I think it would do well for us as Christians to really get to know the Holy Spirit. Amen. Get to know Him. He lives inside of you. He's not there just to hang out in the back corner and seal you and get you to heaven. He's there to be active involved in your life. He speaks to you. You need to listen. 
Who is the Holy Spirit to you? I have this book. It's called the, the Great Doctrines of the Bible. And he has some interesting statements to say as we conclude. He says, We are living in the age of the Holy Spirit. He said the Old Testament may be referred to as the age of the Father. The period covered by the Gospels when Jesus was here may be referred to as the age of the Son. But from Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 until Christ's return may be referred to as the age of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when I uh, open up a Bible and I look, you know, they'll give titles to the books. The book of Acts is often given the title Acts of what? The Apostles. I disagree. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. You read the book, the Holy Spirit is emphasized in the book of Acts. Right? The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. You see that in John chapter 16, and the, the passage that we started with, John chapter 16 and verse 14, he says, He, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me, Jesus. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. I think that we're missing the boat when we're trying to glorify Jesus and ignore the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because the entire ministry of the Holy Spirit is to exalt and to glorify Christ, to help you exalt and to glorify Christ. That's exciting. You want to exalt Christ? You want to know more about Christ? You want to be in love with Christ? Then get to know the Holy Spirit. That's what He does. He helps you with these things. Leads and guides you into all truth. This guy in this great doctrine of the Bible, he says, All matters pertaining to the Holy Spirit should be of special interest to each and every Christian living in the age of the Holy Spirit. Yet how ignorant is the average Christian concerning matters pertaining Sometimes I think in our churches today we're afraid of the Holy Spirit because there are some denominations that have gone to excess in their practice of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But you know what? Because they've gotten things wrong, it doesn't mean that we can't be biblically balanced Amen. on what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is. So let's not let people scare us away from a Bible position on the Holy Spirit. And let's make sure we know Him. He lives here. And there should be a practical outworking of the knowledge of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. All right? Thank you for your attention this morning. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to the rest of the day. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. I thank you for your word, Lord, that we can go to and where we can learn, Lord, that there even is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. Father, I want to thank you uh, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to me, Lord, when I... Uh, was a, apart from you, and Lord, that I needed to be forgiven of my sins and to be given a home in heaven. And just thank you, Lord, for convincing me of the truth. And Father, I pray for one who may be here, who you're working on, and you are convincing them of the truth that they need to trust in you as their Savior. I pray, Lord, that they would listen to you and that, that, it would, that they would obey you today and that they would let you point them to Jesus Christ and that they would call upon the name of Jesus to save them from their sins today. And Father, I pray for each and every Christian that is here Lord, that we would recognize the ministry of the Holy Spirit to those that are lost. Lord, that we would partner with the Holy Spirit when we witness. Lord, that we wouldn't be attempting to produce the conviction, but that we would be relying upon the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. And Father, that we would get to know you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we would rely upon you to lead and guide us into all truth. And Father, that we would understand what it means to walk in the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit. And Lord, that you would be actively involved in our life. Father, in those areas that we may be grieving or quenching, Lord, I pray that you'd give us courage and boldness, Lord, to put those things aside. And Lord, we love you, and thank you for the day ahead. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. They're dismissed until service starts here in a few minutes. All right, thank you for your attention.